This is quite an honor. I didn't realize this was such a milestone in Philippine history. So to be able to participate is quite a privilege. So I'd like to thank the Crop Life Philippines Board um, of Directors. I'd like to thank Ed and uh, particularly Veronica, Kathy, who's helped us, Jerwin as well, Florence, all of you guys have been uh, assisting me for the, over the past two weeks. What I'm going to do now is uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is talk to you about mode of action, and I'm going to pick up where, where Florence essentially uh, has left off. And so I've got my presentation really split into two parts. One really is to continue continue talking about the, the um, uh, labeling piece, but then also to get into a, a bit more technical aspect of, of mode of action. Okay, good. Okay, that was exciting. Um, what I want to point out here, and it was mentioned, I think, in the movie as well as uh, Florence, and that is when we talk about insecticide resistance, it's based on genetic selection. Key here is genetics. That means resistance is transferred uh, by genetic traits. That means that there's a mom and there's a dad and they mate and they transfer their genes to the, uh, to the offspring. And as we look on the right-hand side here, as we talk within the industry, we talk about red, yellow, and green flags. And I have been working with the Philippines team now for the past 12 years. And when we started, believe it or not, the diamides actually were susceptible uh, to diamondback moth. And over time, we started seeing a yellow flag, which essentially is suspicious populations and those that we need to do more research on and, and, and monitor. And then eventually, based on uh, additional selection pressure and overuse, we wind up with red flags. The point is, is that when we get into a red flag situation, that means there's a field failure. That means that we have verified it in the laboratory. It is very difficult to turn this around. On the other hand, a green flag represents those markets which we have susceptible insects. That is worth their weight in gold if you have a market where your insect pests, whether they're weeds, diseases, or insects are still susceptible. And here, is where you need to pay attention. We typically spend a lot of time in the red area when we should be spending more time in the green area because we want to prevent resistance. Okay, this was shown in the movie, but this is a good genetics class. Essentially, we just need to remember that the population is made up of, of uh, resistant, moderately resistant, and susceptible. But what's really key here is that you need to understand is that most of the population is made up of heterozygotes. It's made up of the RS, or the moderately uh, resistant or moderately susceptible. Uh, as much as 75%, 80% of the population is made up of this category. And you look to the right, it's got one resistant allele. But this is the area here. These are the individuals that we really try and remove from the population. And that's what's really critical. Okay, so what is insecticide mode of action? It's essentially, it's, it, mode of action defines the process. It defines the site where the insecticide works in the insect, on the insect, on the outside of the insect, typically at the molecular level. And as Florence pointed out, they, we talk about mode of actions, at least with insecticides as group numbers, all the way up to 32. This is a publication by IRAC, which is nice and small, fits in your back pocket, but it's a great reference. Okay, why do we know the mode of action of insecticides? Again, as pointed out by Florence, that is the key to managing resistance. And I'm gonna point out, we're talking about target site resistance here, okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. There are about 32, as was pointed out. I think I've got 31 shown here, 32 is now um, viruses. And so these are all novel modes of action. What does that mean? That means that if you have resistance to group one, which is carbamates and OPs, that there is not cross resistance to diamides, which are group 28. And if you have resistance to pyrethroids, which are number three, group number three, uh, there should not be cross resistance to spinosad, uh, which is group number five, okay? Very important. But to give you an idea, when we talk about target sites, what are we talking about? We're talking about these sites within the insect that could be chloride channels, sodium channels. They could be rhinidine receptors or calcium ch channels. It could be chitin, which is the, 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 uh, the exoskeleton on an insect. 
all these particular sites on insect that are critical for survival can be disrupted with an insecticide. Okay, now we're talking about target site resistance, and that's really what we are basing our discussion on, and all of our uh, focus is on target site. But remember, there is also metabolic resistance, okay? And here's the difference. Target site resistance means that you spray a molecule, and that molecule then is taken up by the insect and it finds the target site. And here's a target protein. That target protein, essentially, it allows some life-sustaining process to occur. And what happens is the molecule binds to this particular protein, and it shuts down the process. Now, with target site resistance, because of mutations, because of selection pressure, because of genetics and, and the increase of resistant populations, uh, this particular target site has been altered, again, because of a mutation. What happens now is that the molecule, as it tries to interact with this target site uh, on a resistant insect, it cannot bind with it. And what happens then, it's not able to shut down the system, so the insect lives and is, not, and is able to continue uh, surviving. Metabolic resistance is a bit different. Metabolic resistance, you're still working with a target site that's not altered, it's not mutated, but there are enzymes within the insect. And these enzymes uh, on, on resistant insects can have high levels of all different types of enzymes. And what these enzymes do is they mess up the molecule, they can break it down into smaller pieces, they can add um, particular um, uh, atoms and make it larger. The point is, is that these enzymes alter the insecticide molecule and it no longer binds with the target protein. And what happens when it doesn't bind? It means the insect is resistant and it survives. Okay, so again, we have target site resistance, we have metabolic resistance. Our focus right now with the mode of action numbers are re relative to target site resistance. Now, just to pursue this a bit longer, metabolic resistance, uh, typically, if there's resistance to one active ingredient, it usually doesn't confer resistance to other actives, okay? Uh, and there are biochemical targets that differ in their propensity to develop resistance. And by example, what I'm going to say is the nicot nicotinoids, as a great example, have been in the market for decades, but yet most of the resistance that we have found through the, for the, through the first 15 years plus has been metabolic. Uh, and now only recently are we starting to find target site resistance. The diamides, on the other hand, from the time that they were introduced 18 months later when resistance occurs all the way up to the present, the majority of resistance status that we find is target site. So we see differences, I'll say, in the susceptibility of different target sites and their propensity to develop resistance. Now, what's really important to realize is that unlike metabolic resistance, if you have target site resistance to one of these actives, acetamiprid, Essentially, that means that none of the other neonicotinoids will then work. If you have resistance to chlorantranilipril, <clears throat> that means that the other diamides will not work. We have seen uh, in Asia, when we first got resistance of flubendiamide to diamondbacks, then chlorantranilipril, we found that cyantranilipril was still working, but only for about six months, and then eventually it did not work. So that is why when we talk about target site resistance and why we spend so much time on it is because it, it can kill an entire category. It can wipe out all the products in a particular group uh, uh, mode of action number. Okay, very, very important and very dangerous. Okay, so how do we resolve this? How, what's, what's our solution? As was pointed out earlier, we rotate. We rotate insecticides. We follow the rule to prevent resistance. We alternate insecticides with different modes of action. Ideally, you'll hear people talk and you'll see it in our labels. We try not to treat two successive insect generations. It's really hard sometimes to figure out what a generation is, when it begins, when it ends. And so then we talk about windows, which are 30, 35 day windows. And we talk about using the same mode of actions 
mode of action products within a window, and then we talk about rotating these windows, okay? Because the bottom line is that we don't want repeated exposure of the pest populations to insecticides with the same mode of action over a long period of time, which is why for us rotation is so critical. Now, really need to pay attention to this one because this is a question that people in the field, uh, you're, you are the, um, the frontliners, uh, you are the trainers. This is a question that typically you will often get. Well, wait a minute now, am I supposed to rotate for resistance management or am I supposed to mix? Am I supposed to, to, to buy pre-mixes or am I supposed to do tank mixes? There are differences between resistance management for fungicides and herbicides versus insecticides. And this confuses the hell out of the customer. Okay, for insecticides, our preferred, our much preferred, our most preferred is rotation. However, you talk to a plant pathologist and you talk about their resistance manager program, it sounds like in August, you will be hearing experts in September from both of these. They will be explaining why they prefer mixtures. Herbicide uh, specialists, they prefer mixtures, but insecticides, we prefer rotation. The bottom line, as you really push uh, the fungicide and herbicide colleagues, they'll say, well, what's acceptable is rotation as well, but this top line is really what's preferred. Uh, and the bottom line is that whether you rotate or mix, you still have to know modes of action, okay? For fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, it's still critical. But remember, for insecticides, you rotate. Very simple, for the grower, for the customer, what does he need to understand? Three things. What's the mode of action for each product? Where can you find it? What do I do with it? That's one of the biggest issues. We have a lot of companies who are putting the mode of action on the front page of labels, but they're not explaining what you do with it, okay? So what is the mode of action for each product? You'll find it on labels. You'll find it on customer communications. You'll find it in that pamphlet that I showed you. You'll find it in all different types of areas. And ideally where to find it is uh, just put an app on your cell phone and you can download it for free. This is the IRAC International Mode of Action. And all you need to do is uh, just type in IRAC MOA and it's pretty uh, visible and discernible for anything else that's out there. And you'll be able to search for active ingredients right from your cell phones. Now, that's where to find it. That's what it is. Now, what do you do with it? And this was referenced by Florence just earlier. So for, for the ag chemical companies, for the crop life companies that are out there today listening, this is an absolute requirement. For FPA, this is an absolute requirement. Just putting the mode of action icon on the front page or somewhere in, in the label is not enough. You need to explain what do you do with it? And not just for insecticides, it has to be done for fungicides and herbicides as well. So very simply, CropLife International and CropLife International is now beginning to uh, uh, recommend, and uh, I'll say mandate, but that's within reason. We're saying three things need to be on the label. One, the mode of action group number. We're also saying that you need to have a statement, and this is in the, the recommended label statement, the mode of action group number, uh, some type of a comment about avoid treating consecutive generations, and the third point is rotating. And then I've got a simple label here where I pointed out number one, two, and three, the mode of action number, the two, the comment about avoid treating consecutive generations, the third point, rotate, use application windows. Three very simple items, and this is what needs to be communicated to growers. And if you want a visual, here's a great one produced by the Philippine Diamide team eight years ago, nine years ago, that both Audi was on. Uh, Florence led this group and created some great communications for the growers. Very simple ones, but here's a mode of action rotation by windows. This happened to be for diamondback moth. Here's the generations throughout a particular uh, uh, crucifer season. And you can see where we're, mo we're rotating mode of action X's, Y's, and Z's. And there's two options here, actually within the middle of season, you can rotate mode of action Y with mode of action A. Uh, the point is, is that it, wherever you use a a mode of action in one window, you do not use it in the next window. Very simple. And here's a great recommendation. And what's not recommended is using the same mode of action through the entire season. Okay. 
what's also very important, we talk, we're talking a lot about mode of actions, but also realize that when we talk about a mode of action, very often the products in that same mode of action have fairly similar characteristics. And so that's kind of important to know uh, the attributes. And so as a frontliner, you need to make sure that you are communicating the attributes of products to the customers and to the grower. And, and what does that mean? That means the grower needs to know, is this a contact product or is it an ingestion product? Does it take out adults? Is it ovicidal? What type of broad spectrum, any type of spectrum does it have? Does it take out lefts as well as sucking insect pests? What's its impact on beneficial safety? Is it a systemic translaminar product? Also really very critical is, is knowing the spray timing and number of applications. Treatment thresholds differ by product, okay? Do not believe that one treatment threshold fits all products. If you're working with a pyrethroid, your, your threshold may be at first larvae or first site of damage because you can use that as a rescue treatment. If you're talking about the diamides, you do not want to do that. You're looking now almost way back. You're looking at adult flight. You're talking about the beginning of egg lay because it's an ingestion product. Very, very critical. So you can lump pyrethroids, you can lump uh, um, diamides because they're the same mode of action. So you can begin to understand, you, you need to teach your customers that they can use the mode of action number as, as a possible indicator for attributes and also the impact it's gonna have with regard to thresholds. And why is this important? All these things impact resistance management. Every time you make a spray, you need to maximize your control, your kill in the entire generation. What does that mean? That means you need to take out as many multiple pest stages as you can, not just the larvae, but you need to try and take out the adults. You need to try and take out the eggs. And that is you need to have maximum kill. And that's what removes the heterozygotes, the RSs from the population. Does it conserve beneficials? Early in the season, you really want to use products that are conserving beneficials because they assist in resistance management. It's part of IPM. What happens if you use the wrong threshold? You wind up using a pyrethroid threshold for a diamide, and you wind up having larvae that are, that are still living. That's poor timing. That means poor control. That leaves heterozygotes in the population. So all of these are all critical. They're all related to mode of action, but they're specific to the attributes and they're specific to the products. Okay, now I'm gonna spend the second half of this presentation getting a lot more technical and trying to understand how insects bind to target sites, how they attack target sites at the molecular level is complicated. And this is not something that you really want to communicate to customers, okay? Uh, it, it, it's confusing. However, as an influencer, as a frontliner, as a, as a trainer, and as an expert, there's probably some level of understanding that I think would be helpful to you. So I've got the next couple of slides. I want to go through uh, a list of insecticides that Florence gave me, and I want to try and explain to you how they impact the insect at the molecular level. So that gives you some insights. Uh, Florence shows something very similar. These are all the different uh, target sites uh, that affect lepidopterans. These are all the target sites that affect sucking insects. And frankly, many of these modes of actions affect both lepidopterans and, and sucking insects. So they're broader spectrum. But what we do, I think was alluded to by Florence earlier, is that we tend to break the activity up into these categories, nerve and muscle, growth, respiration, mid-gut, and then there's some we really don't know, they're, they're unknown. But what is important to know is that if we look at all those modes of action, those products, those chemistries that are in the nerve and muscle and in the growth category, that represents 95% of the current commercial available products. Okay, so these top two are really important. And frankly, I bet probably 80% or 75% are in the nerve and muscle area. Okay, let's look at a crude diagram of a neuromuscular pathway. This is a, a signaling pathway. This is as the nerve and, and messages from external stimuli, from an ingestion of a molecule. Uh, this is where the stimuli moves from the left to the right. 
Okay, it, mer it moves from the, the central peripheral nerve. It grows down the sodium channel. Uh, it, uh, there's a release of, of something called a neurotransmitter, which essentially it's a, it's a chemical messenger, which is acetylcholine. Uh, we see it go across this gap right here, uh, and, and we call that, um, uh, yeah, essentially it's, it, it's a, um, um, a really, a, well, what's the word I want to use? But we'll say it's just a gap at this point in time. It, it looks a lot wider here than what it actually is. Then you have the receptors on the other side that receive the acetylcholine, and they're called uh, and, and break it down, and they're they're called acetylcholine esterase. And now we're this is the the motor nerve. And as you continue down the motor nerve toward the muscle fiber, there's another group of receptors which are called GABA receptors. And then there, and then once we get actually into the muscle, we start talking about mitochondria, which produce energy. We start talking about ranadine receptors, which regulate calcium. So this is a great picture that just shows you all the potential sites that can be and have been exploited and utilized by many agricultural chemical companies to control insects. Okay, so let's start with the the first one, uh, so far left, these are disruptors of the sodium channel. So we've got the pyrethroids and we have the ox oxidizings. And so the pyrethroids you're very familiar with, bifenthrin, cypermethrin, lambda, permethrin, oxidizings, ox uh, indoxycarbon metaflumazone. Okay, now what's interesting, what's really cool about this, they both affect the sodium channels. However, one opens the sodium channels and allows ions to just, sodium ions to just flow in unregulated. Then you have the oxidizings, which block it and don't allow any sodium ions to, to uh, uh, flow in. What's interesting is both processes paralyze the insect. However, uh, they do it the exact opposite way. Now, what happens if you combine these two in the tank? Nothing. They both work. <laughs> they, they work as a pre tank mix. Uh, they work solo. Uh, it is interesting. You would expect to see some type of antagonism, but uh, you don't. But it is interesting how both of these do the exact opposite thing to sodium channels. Okay, now let's look at the organophosphates and the carbamates. Now you see we're moving a little bit further now from left to right, and we're now looking at where there's nerve conduction. There's, um, there's a movement of the sodium channel transmitter, again, acetylcholine, and that's, it's moving now toward the muscles and it's trying to send messages over to the muscle. And, and there's this gap here, which really we call a synapse. It's a, a neuromuscular junction. And this is where the message is delivered. It has to cross this juncture. And so acetylcholine crosses it over to the motor nerve. Well, now it's gonna be broken down because if it isn't broken down, it's going to continue sending the message, sending the message, sending the message. So what does the carbamates and OPs do? They, they uh, destroy acetylcholine esterase. They do not allow the breakdown of acetylcholine. So what happens is it overstimulates. It hyperexcites the insect to the point where, where it dies. It, it's like you drinking 10 cups of coffee. How do you feel after you do that? Except you'll survive that. Insects are not going to because it hyperexcites them. Okay, now let's look at the group of insecticides that impact the motor nerve, the motor nerve. And this is, we're still in the area that OPs and carbamates work, uh, but we're looking specifically at acetylcholine neurotransmitter. And this is, these are affected by the neonics, by spinosids, and by CARTAP. Uh, and they have a wide range of impact. Um, they range from super stimulators to process blockers. And so you've got the neonics, as you know, acetamiprid, dinotetron, aminocloprid, thymophoxin, thiocloprid. Then you have this group that isn't necessarily all that popular. It's the neurotoxin uh, neuro analogs uh, used in rice and a number of other crops. Well, they also block and paralyze and they attack that same area, not necessarily the exact same site, Remember, keep in mind, every time you have a different mode of action, it's a different site on, in this case, the nervous system, but, but it's very, sometimes they can be very close. But then now you have, now these two paralyze. What does spinosa does? Spinosa hyper excites. So you have hyper stimulation. So here's a great example where you've got, you got three modes of action that work very close to each other on the nervous system, 
but they do just like uh, with pyrethroids and in doxycarb, they do the exact opposite, but they uh, wind up with the same, same result, which is a dead insect. Okay, now we have the GABA chloride blockers. And um, this is an interesting one and it has old chemistry. This is um, essentially, it's the uh, ethoprol and, and fipronil, pretty much the only two products. And also I guess any cyclodienes that are left in the market. And, and this is a receptor that's much closer to the muscle fiber. Uh, and this also, it impacts the neurotransmitter uh, receptor and, and, and the, phenol, uh, the phenylpyrazoles, what they do is they affect the chloride channel blocker, which essentially kills the insect, okay? And so now let's move into the muscle. So what we've done is we've gone from the central nervous system, from the sodium channels down into the motor nerve, and now we're in the muscle. Now, in the muscle, there are receptors called ranidine receptors. And actually, ranidine receptors occur in lots of places, but there's a lot of them in the muscle, and they're absolutely critical for muscle contraction. What do the diamides do? You have chlorantranilipril, cyantranilipril, flubendiamide, tetranilipril. Okay, so you got a number of diamides on the market today, more coming, but they all do the same thing, and that, that is they, they release... Uh, stored calcium ions. They just, they, they open up the rounding receptor and unchecked all the calcium flows into the muscle and, and it results again in paralysis. It's amazing how many of these modes of action, how many of these products essentially paralyze the insect and sometimes they starve to death, uh, which is essentially the cause of death. But this one happens to be the calcium. Okay, and then uh, we move to another uh, uh, nerve target. And this is, again, this is what we're calling the, um, uh, the glutamate chloride modulators. This is a mouthful. Uh, and, but what's interesting is there's quite a few of them and they're spread out over the nervous system. And they're also right there on the interface with the muscle. And these are also chloride channel inhibitors. And here, this mainly right now is mainly the avramectin, so abamectin and emamectin, okay? And then this is the most interesting one. It, it falls into the, um, the category of muscles uh, and nerves, but this is on the outside of the insect. And this is what we call a cortitonal organ, which essentially it's, um, it's an organ that's in the antenna, it's in the joints of the insect. And, and insects have uh, different types of receptors there where they're able to monitor environmental stimulus. And what do they do with that, that stimulus? They then send it through the, through the uh, nervous system and they send it to the muscles. And they, these, mu these stretch receptors essentially, essentially tell, the muscle, tell the muscles, hang on to the plant, run, flight, or fight. And so these particular, this one particular insect, pymetrazine, and also there's a new one on the market, fitopyropen, uh, which is again, both of them the same mode of action. They affect the, the, uh, the receptor. They affect how it functions. And essentially what happens is that messages then are not sent to the muscles. The insect falls off the plant. It can't hold on to the plant. It can't locomote, it can't move. So a very interesting mode of action, but it's also a bit slow too. Okay, so we, are, we just completed now the uh, nerve and muscle. So now we're gonna move into another fairly large category, but I can really summarize this actually fairly quickly. And this is the category that, that really, uh, uh, that contains the, the growth regulators. And when I say growth regulators, we're talking about lepidopteran larvae that have to molt. We're talking about, um, uh, uh, we're talking about, uh, other types of piercing, sucking insects, uh, homopterans, um, uh, hemipterans that uh, they don't necessarily molt, but they do go from di to, to different instars, but all of them have to go from some type of an immature stage to an adult stage. Essentially, all of the insecticides in this category have some type of effect on a dixone and on a juvenile hormone. A dixone essentially, it it releases, uh, uh, is a product that's released and induces molting. So when we look at the Lepidopteran larvae, we have some larvae, many larvae that go through two, three, maybe four instars. There's some that go through seven instars, then they pupate, and then they, and then they go through metamorphosis to an adult. If you disrupt the ecdysone, you disrupt the molting, 
what happens is then uh, it, it, you can uh, persistently create a nictisone, which means the insect doesn't molt or it tries to partially molt or it tries to partially pupate. It's not successful in pupating. It can't remove the exoskeleton that it has around its body, which contains chitin, and, and it dies. And I've got a picture that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, juvenile hormone, very simply, uh, prevents molting to a more mature stage. So if you look at the level of juvenile hormone here, there's a high level of juvenile hormone when the insect is a juvenile, when it's immature. But then at a specific time, the titer or the amount in the blood drops off. That's then an indication to the insect, and there's chemistry that goes on that says, okay, now it's time to pupate or it's time to move to an adult stage. Well, if you can have a juvenile hormone mimic that you can spray, what happens is that the insect never makes it to the adult stage. It stays as an immature stage and, and then typically does not survive. This is a result of what insect growth regulators do. So you can see all the different types of various methods or various observations that you can make where insects are unable to molt. You have pupae where the adult's not able to emerge. You've got larvae here that get partially out of their exoskeleton, but then they get restricted and they wind up dying. Uh, lower right-hand side, you see a, you see a, um, a, um, uh, an untreated larvae, and then you can see uh, all these other larvae which are being affected. So juvenile hormones have a, a horrendous impact on the insect as it's trying to, uh, to molt. Uh, and, but in, and it can be a bit slow because you have to wait for it to go through a particular instar, or you have to wait until it reaches the adult stage, but still uh, a very effective group of products. And there's a lot of them. Uh, as you can see here, you got all different modes of action. Again, they, they act at different sites on the insect. We got chromosome, trimosome, bupropesin, lufenuron, spirotetramat. Um, so you've got, uh, oops, you've got a, quite a, a number of, of different types of products that represent a lot of different modes of action, but they all have some impact on molding, uh, disrupting molting, inhibiting chitin production. Okay, so they are your growth regulators. Let's move to respiration. Uh, there's only one slide here, and this happens to be two modes of action that um, impact mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are absolutely critical because they produce energy, not just in insects, but in humans and, and in vertebrates. Uh, mitochondria are really, they're the energy producers within our bodies. They actually transfer oxygen into energy. And so it's, it's a great site for control, but one that you have to be a bit cautious because this is a, a critical uh, life-sustaining process in humans as well. Uh, but you see uh, diphenthyron, and then there's a number of other products, uh, phenazequin and paratabin and, and tolfenpyrid, uh, but they all do the same thing. They disrupt uh, the mitochondria and their production of ATP or the production of, of energy. So then let's move to mid-gut, mid -gut, and that's really the last category that I want to discuss. And this really uh, covers all the BTs, and this is essentially the same as uh, BTs that really are in your GMOs. Essentially, it's pretty much kind of the same. Also, baccalaureate viruses, uh, and, and um, uh, so it's, it's two different group numbers, 11 and 31. But what happens specifically with BT is that it has spores, and that's what you're spraying out there. You're spraying the spore forming bacteria, and it produces a toxin in the gut of the insect that's very specific to insects, does not have impact on humans or any type of a mammal. And then the toxin crystal gets dissolved, but it gets dissolved by an enzyme that the insect produces. So the insect really is responsible for creating a toxic form of the BT crystal. And then what it does, it really is, is, um, is, is very efficient at disintegrating the cells in the stomach and essentially it dissolves the insect. And so uh, a lot of BTs in the market and they, they are very effective and against the insect but very safe to non-targets. So I have a, a conclusion, concluding slide here because now after going through all these classes, someone may say, Okay, well, what does all this mean? Does it mean that we should be 
rotating specific mode of action products that are in a nerve and muscle class with each other? And the answer is no, not, not specifically. That's not the recommendation. Should we be rotating modes of action that are in the nerve and muscle class with those with are in the growth or the respiration? No, not necessarily. Now, the bottom line is you want to rotate all the modes of actions. Doesn't matter which ones you rotate with, within a category and across a category, using the 30 day window rotation strategy, and ideally not to treat successive generations. And I'm going to leave you with this slide again, once again, for insecticides, we want to rotate, not do not treat successive generations. And finally, the last word here is managing resistance is a hell of a lot more difficult than preventing resistance, okay? And that's why we want to concentrate where there's susceptibility. We want to work on maintaining that susceptibility. Okay, that is it for me.